I'm JC Hertz. I have been fighting to make the public sector and critical infrastructure safe for open source for about 15 years. A lot of that involves incredibly unglamorous discussions in rooms with no natural light to keep large corporations from convincing the Department of Defense that open source is illegal and against federal acquisition regulations. So there's been a, a lot of lawyering, a lot of policying through the last uh, decade and a half. And the success of open source in critical infrastructure stands as a testament to the efforts of a lot of people in some really, really big, very dense bureaucracies uh, to advocate for open source. And this includes not only defense and national security, but also energy, healthcare, telecom, and a lot of the sectors that I like to categorize in preventing the zombie apocalypse, right? The things that if they fall, we're all going to be in a very, very bad place. So the focus in decade and a half ago was about code composition. And was there any GPL in open source? And the shift to vulnerability management was, okay, well, is there anything vulnerable in this stuff? And a lot of the more highly regulated sectors demanded more transparency of their suppliers because, again, zombie apocalypse. And now the focus is beginning to shift from software composition analysis, which software composition analysis, you're welcome. The, the industry has, has a lot of revenue because of some of these changes. But now it's about suppliers. It's about what are the organizations and maintainers of these capabilities? And are they reliable? Are, is there risk in there? And it's not just the, the open source development. Uh, it's all of the companies that take those capabilities and wrap them up and bundle them and deliver them into power plants or into telecom infrastructure or into a defense program. So this talk is really to tee up how that risk calculus is shifting, how the transparency initiatives that are being pushed by regulators are working their way through a very complex multi-tier supply chain that goes from an open source project through to a uh, app developer to an integrator to a customer and maybe to an international partner and the difficulty of that transparency initiative and why it matters to the open source community so where i work in the high assurance world um, there's typically a lot more regulation that exists because of governments uh, and because of industry best practices uh, so there's non-voluntary mandates. And there's also a logistics issue. So my, my company focuses on software logistics and making sure that software can securely move around from the end-to-end -end process of the open source community to that subcontractor, to contractor, to customer, to a different network, and how to keep it continuously assured. And one of the big differences there and this is also the case in healthcare and in finance and energy, is that you don't have a direct connection to the internet at all times, right? These things exist on networks that may not be connected. There's great reasons not to directly connect your power plant to the internet. And so we have to solve these transparency problems and these supply chain risk management problems in discontiguous environments. So open source, 15 years ago, it was the Rebel Alliance and people were talking about how open source is, a, is like a free puppy, right? Well, the puppy grew up. Part of this focus on supplier risk and supply chain risk management is actually the victory of open source, right? Open source is so big and so pervasive and so vital to all these enterprises that the inevitable risk calculus goes towards, oh, okay, so who's maintaining this? 
um, this is my actual dog. I spend a lot of money on premium grain-free dog food every month for two Mastodors, Mastiff Labrador combinations. So these things are resource intensive. Open source, if it's going to be a true enterprise capability and, and truly what we rely on, is resource intensive. We all run our own operation and maintenance of it, and we want that maintenance to be performed well. And this is what is shifting the visibility towards suppliers and whether the people who develop capabilities and incorporate open source components are actually doing a good job as suppliers. There's also a threat landscape which has changed. So we see dependency attacks, we see repo hijacking, we see typo squatting, and, and these are all things that companies and automation platforms and analysts who look at supplier risk are paying attention to, right? These are supply chain attacks that are launched that don't necessarily have to do with code composition and whether you've got the right license in there. Um, a lot of them have to do with actions in the supply chain. And there's also a, a much more robust kind of actor that wants to launch supply chain attacks. So we have state actors at work. Uh, and this plays out in the realm of you know, foreign relations, foreign policy, cyber war. And that's more than a lot of uh, the regulated enterprises can really handle uh, manually. And so we, we see the threats escalating and we've just seen some really egregious state actor breaches. And so we really have to start to look at whether the people who are maintaining capabilities are doing a good job being stewards of critical infrastructure. Right? So you start to see a lot of what we call these the dreaded flow down provisions, right, is that some regulated customer is subject to a mandate that says you have to be a super responsible steward or at least do some compliance paperwork to attest that you are. And you're going to make everybody underneath you do the same thing. And you're going to put it in all your contracts. And so it's the customer's 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 provision that ultimately affects some two to five person company right, that doesn't have all this compliance infrastructure. So, you know, security rolls downhill, at least, I think that's what the S is supposed to stand for. And you see these mandates coming down. And so you have things like uh, an FDA requirement that says, well, if you want regulatory approval for a medical device, you're gonna have to submit a software bill of materials. And I'm proud to say I worked on some of the language that was referenced by the FDA in this regulatory guidance um, at the Department of Commerce, the NTIA effort on software transparency. But that's becoming table stakes, right? Software bill of materials, show me what's in your stuff that's not your special sauce if you want a medical device, because none of us want a compromise of people's pacemakers or CAT scanners or any of the things that operate around, in, or on a human being in a medical situation. Anything with safety considerations is going to follow suit. And we've already started to see this in, you know, in energy and in automotive. Uh, a lot of the IoT discussions are around this, but even just in the straight up software supply chain. There's a regulatory regime called CMMC. Anyone who's already heard about it or read about it is is going to be probably covering their eyes right now but it has to do with proving to a, a regulator that you are being vigilant in the protection of your data and there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that's not really about software scanning um, it really has to do with your behavior as a supplier and it affects a lot of companies and their subcontractors and it's like the old shampoo commercial, you know, and, and they required it of two suppliers and they required it of two subcontractors and so on and so on.
and it scopes out to a lot of organizations, many of which are small firms that are not necessarily capitalized to do huge amounts of compliance. Um, NIST, National In Institute for Standards and Technologies, has a new revision of its uh, 800.53 regulatory um, or standards about uh, cyber vigilance and cybersecurity. That includes a lot of supply chain risk management controls. And you may not be directly affected by these things, but someone who uses your software probably is. There's executive orders and uh, you know presidents write them all the time. Uh, but when it comes to some of these supply chain risk management and supplier executive orders, these things are difficult to unwind, even if an administration changes. Um, there are steps that get put into place and risk decisions that are made that are very difficult to walk back. And this is not just the United States. So there are similar initiatives that are going on in Europe, in Japan, and elsewhere. Every country with critical infrastructure has justifiable reasons to be really worried right now about hostile actors and their efforts to take critical infrastructure offline. And so that's what's driving a lot of this as well internationally. Now, in terms of open source, people who develop open source capabilities of which there are many great capabilities and where a lot of great innovation has come from, comes from, and will continue to come from, tend to put their own efforts in the context of a commercial software world, of a huge open source ecosystem, of an academic ecosystem. But the thing about open source as a flow is that it goes to a very, very complex supplier ecosystem, right? So anyone who builds code is usually pulling in dependencies. They're passing that assembly of their own code and somebody else's code along to someone else. That entity may be pa passing it along to someone else. Uh, and so this really, really goes beyond kind of sec dev ops right, and first party development of something you're gonna deploy yourself into the whole notion of a, a supplier ecosystem and a supply chain where there are discontinuities at every step along the way and where there may be kinds of risks that your application scanner or your uh, system, system security plan in your first party entity might not be picking up. So we all need to think harder about these ecosystems and how do I as a maintainer or as a consumer of an open source capability start to get at better provenance and pedigree for what I've got so that I can prove it to the next person and hopefully they can prove it to the entity after that that takes delivery of that capability. So continuity. There's a lot of focus on secure DevOps, securing the pipeline, SAS in the pipeline, break the build. All that is amazing, but it doesn't actually solve the supply chain problem. So in many cases, there's a, it's a kind of a, a lamppost problem, right? People are looking under the lamppost because that's where they would see the keys, not where they lost their keys. So where they lost their keys, and this is a graphic from Breaking Trust, which is the Atlantic Council report that, that came out this relatively recently, which is phenomenal and an incredible piece of work. But there are so many places in the supply chain where compromise can happen, right? So you have supply chain attacks that happen in the, the source code repositories, you have package managers, you have SDKs, you have, there's so many different places in the supply chain that are not the repo and that are not the build pipeline where things can be compromised. And this is why suppliers and supplier vigilance is important. It's why transparency is important. And it's where suppliers are gonna want 
proof that what they're taking delivery of is actually what it says it is and what happened to it along the way. And this is all being clocked. So I can say this because I do this every day. The times it takes for the remediation of issues by suppliers, the detection, the repair, the delivery to update, we clock all that stuff. And so when a supplier has a capability in which there is a newly published vulnerability and they're under continuous monitoring as a supplier, the customer knows and there's a stopwatch. And so the time it takes the supplier to detect, fix and update that capability, that goes into their supplier risk score because there are certain suppliers that are very responsive, right? Maybe they're doing their sec DevOps, they find something, they do a dependency update, they have a very low level of technical debt and they ship an update to their customers quickly or they alert their customers that an update is available. There are other suppliers that may not be building their capabilities every day, and most capabilities aren't built every day. At some point, there's a life cycle where things aren't being built every day. They take a long time to fix things because fixing things isn't fun. And then when they ship a new release is anybody's guess. So we've seen the remediation times for suppliers in critical infrastructure vary from hours to the better part of a year. And it could be longer. That's just how long we've been longitudinally measuring them. So this starts to, this starts to factor, right? If something goes wrong, how long is my supplier going to take to detect it? to fix it and to get me a remediated update. And that's all being measured now so it can be managed. So maintenance. Maintenance is not glamorous, it's not sexy, it's not fun, but maintenance is the biggest source of supplier risk. Typically, when we have a customer in critical infrastructure and we're doing out-of-band monitoring on the composition of a supplier capability, it could be a contractor, it could be a vendor, it could be open source component, and uh, there's a finding that puts the enterprise at risk and a communication back to the supplier, there's a lot of, we'll put it in our backlog. Right? And um, oftentimes the vendors they don't want to know. Um, they do a lot to avoid reading the findings. And that's just past the point of being acceptable for critical systems. There's a little bit of an information theory wrinkle here too, um, because there's a very, very fine line and, and you pretty much a blur between Failure to maintain, intentional failure to maintain, gross negligence, and sabotage. So one of the interesting things about certain findings about certain systems that are so badly maintained that they're exploitable is that there's no way to prove that a supplier intentionally fail to maintain their system in a way that they knew how to exploit, right? Plausible deniability, it's brilliant. But at the end of the day, from a security perspective, it doesn't matter to the critical infrastructure that goes offline that you, you were really a nice person and you, know, you were intending to fix on something sometime uh, what what matters is that it was it was left unfixed and it was exploited um, either by someone else or by you. So these are supplier risks, and you you're going to start to see some terms and conditions and transparency requirements that are kind of toothy. Um, 
that uh, are a little scary for um, some of the, the vendors. Um, but that should be good news to open source communities because if anything, they're gonna surface how integral to, to the ecosystem and how integral to our critical infrastructure open source capabilities really are. I like to include this document in all the presentations that I can. It's called the Simple Sabotage Manual and it's sort of a very old school piece of evidence about the point that I just made about plausible deniability and maintenance and sabotage. So this document was dropped behind enemy lines um, by the United States Office of Strategic Services in World War II. And it had to do with, well, if you wanna sabotage things, uh, but you don't wanna up and join the resistance, right? What are some things you can do? And a lot of it had to do with maintenance. Leave tools dull, leave the caps off of things. Um, and, and these are the ways that you can bring an enterprise to kind of a creaking halt or make it less responsive under attack, right? Because it's just, things are so badly maintained that you can't get up and respond. Um, on the right, I, I, I like to put the, if you want to sabotage uh, an organization and you happen to be a member of management, um, because these um, sabotage instructions are generally the way we run things as a matter of regular course in large bureaucracies um, and uh, bureaucratic nonprofit organizations. Um, Anyway, find this on the internet, it's, it's good fun. Bottom line, we see a, a risk differentiation, right? And a drive to quality. And 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, when we were all you know, in the trenches fighting the fight for open source, it was really, there was this um, duality between open source and proprietary, right? Open source versus proprietary. Um, now, proprietary stuff had a lot of open source in it anyway, but they didn't want anybody to know. But we, 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 we used this categorization, but it's not really valid anymore, uh, partly because uh, open source has eaten the world, fortunately, and uh, a lot of the proprietary capabilities and the vendor capabilities that we use have a lot of open source in it, which we should know about but also because open source isn't open source you know this is we're not back in the day where you know everything was a GNU project with tons of awesome community spirit behind it it there's really really well supported industrial enterprise grade open source and then there's folks student projects and um things that someone thought was cool someday and then left, and those are not the same things. So I say, you know, a, a GIA certified diamond is not the same as crazy jewels. And this is how we need to start thinking about open source as, you know, what, what are the real gems that we have that we need to take care of? What are, are maybe diamonds in the rough? And what are crazy jewels that you may want to play with, you definitely don't want to chew on? And again, maintenance, right? So as a risk factor, you're gonna see maintenance show up in things like security SLAs, right? So we measure these, we enforce these. If you have a system that you're delivering to critical infrastructure and one day, as happens, there's a critical vulnerability in some component of it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of critical infrastructure, you're gonna see terms and conditions like, well, buddy, you got seven days to fix it and ship me an update. And if you don't, there's some remedies because these kinds of contractual conditions are generally what get people's attention. And when you can automate the measurement of this, the screenshot of a project that for monitoring, then you can man you can manage it. What gets measured gets managed. So we maintain maintenance records on thousands of open source components. And when it comes to supply chain risk management, your su supplier selection, part of it is, okay, if there's two libraries that do roughly the same things, which do you wanna use? 
do you want to use the thing that has a four day time to remediation? Or do you want to use the thing that's had critical vulnerabilities for 14 months and no one cares? So whatever your rule set happens to be, days in compliance, days out of compliance, time to remediation, all of that can be racked and stacked at scale and that's being done. And people who run critical infrastructure and develop it, so a medical device manufacturer, can now make an informed decision about whether your senior year project should be in their medical device. And if, it's, if you're the one who did the senior year project, you would probably be appalled that some medical device manufacturer, because they found it when they were in college, might think to include this library in their medical device. Um, but there's no hard evidence, right? There's a comfort factor. We use what we're used to. Um, but now there's actual data that says this is a non-maintained capability. Here's the mean time to remediation for the open source maintainer of this component. Um, and that can get better or worse, right? That can be people losing interest or it can be more people being interested and your maintenance time and your maintenance record improves. So how does this affect open source developers and the ecosystems? Because I know a lot of folks who work on open source, they look at these big bureaucracies, they look at governments, they look at federal contractors, and they're like, well, all this transparency and risk and stuff, that's a, that, that looks like a you problem, not a me problem. I'm just working on my code. And I can understand that. The issue is that the security and risk calculus is going to be done by someone. And whoever does that, there's a point of control. And my affinity with the open source community as someone who's fought for open source in these big regulated critical infrastructures is to have that point of control as close to the edge as possible so that the open source community and open source maintainers themselves can own their verification, can own their security, can um, differentiate themselves, as opposed to having rather opaque um, gators um, occluding that uh, function from them. So the upshots are software builds and materials. For people who are developing with modern engineering methods, that's that's kind of a hat trick, right? You can spit it out of a build pipeline, you can put it into your repo. There's formats like SPDX and Cyclone DX and you know all these formats that you can spit out an SBOM and uh, do a lot of verification. There's a requirement for verification, right? So not just what do I say about my capabilities, but what can be proven about my capabilities. So I've been privileged to work with Steve Springett and others on the OWASP software component verification standard, right? Which really goes deep into the provenance and pedigree of things and what can be proven and what can be automated. And ideally something that can be done on a continuous basis. And for the open source community to adopt these things and to really start to step up gives them a lot of initiative. It gets, it, it's healthy for the community to, to shore itself up and to be able to prove its own security. And the last thing I would say is that there needs to be a chain of trust established between source and binary because we're seeing a lot of discrepancies between what's in a source code repo and what's in a package manager. And there's not a strong chain of trust between those two things. And ultimately, it, it can affect the acceptability of a package manager as a distribution mechanism. So our package managers are very important. They're widely used by a ton of people. But critical infrastructure is not super psyched to use source code that goes through some process that's opaque and becomes a package that's 
turns out to be different in significant ways and sometimes in harmful ways from the source code repository itself. So the scenarios are the establishment of a chain of trust between the source code and the binary by the package managers or some kind of alternate chain of trust where source is the authority and there's some intermediary that does a trusted build and makes it available. And I don't really have a dog in the fight here, but this needs to happen and it's going to happen. And so this is just something to be aware of on the horizon and to take steps to establish if you care about the viability of the package managers. Supply chain risk management, um, we're looking at things like concentration risk. So for any given organization, um, one of the beauties of software bills and materials and the ability to look N layers down into the supply chain is you start to see the interdependency of these things. And for components that are very highly relied upon, that are transitive dependencies in everything, which you might not have been able to see before, um, those things are going to start to get attention. And I think that's good. So they might be escrowed. Uh, someone might t decide that, wow, this is in 41% of our stuff. Maybe we should dedicate some time to upstream some fixes to that open source project, which would also be good. The one favor that uh, people in security and critical infrastructure, I think, would ask of open source is some kind of responsible end of life policy for open source. So commercial vendor products say, we're not supporting Acme version 1.4 as of this date. That doesn't necessarily happen with open source. End of life is a real security issue. And it would be wonderful if open source developers and maintainers could put a little bit of thought into, you know, when does something get archived? Um, and there's certain organizations like, you know, even big bureaucratic organizations like GSA have an auto archiving for their GitHub repositories where if something goes 90 days without an update, it gets auto archived. And these pieces of business practice and business process and automation and supplier behavior go a long way um, to de-risk organizations that don't have mechanisms to you know, come through uh, and analyze whether something is end of life or not. As I said before, it's very important for the open source community to drive this. And there's great efforts from OWASP and from a lot of the maintainers to do this. Um, it's very important to achieve some transparency not only in what's in something, but whether it's supported or not. And the process and the verifiability of the, sure, the assurance that's produced. The chain of custody, where did something come from? And the reproducibility of results. Because all of these things are reasonable and sane requirements for suppliers. In, in any kind of critical infrastructure system. And if an ecosystem cannot support reasonable and sane requirements related to supplier risk, then there's a whole bunch of unreasonable and insane ones that I hear discussed regularly. And that that's just not a world we want to live in. So as they say in Washington, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And there are a lot of folks who have just fought so hard to create space and oxygen for open source in critical infrastructure that we just don't want to see that all that effort wasted and things wrapped up and occluded and appropriated and put on the menu when they should be at the table. I will leave you with this. Most people who maintain critical infrastructure understand 
that there are some pillars and the people who maintain the pillars are generally doing so thanklessly. And it would be terrible to see all that modern digital infrastructure either get pulled down or just slowed to a halt because of catastrophes in the supply chain. And that's what all this new uh, risk calculus is driving towards. And I think there are smart, sane, and reasonable steps that we can all take. Um, I know that I personally and Ion Channel are going to help the open source community assure itself in whatever way we can. And uh, we know there's enough smarts out there to get it done. There's some references. Um, you know, anyone who wants to curl up with 480 pages of NIST standards uh, can do so. Uh, and I'm sure this presentation will be available to people later um, just to understand you know, what's coming down the line. Um, and thank you very much. Please find me.